invite uh, Ashlyn O'Neill from the um, Center for Teaching and Learning in the Office of Open Learning to discuss the PALS program and the support that they're going to aim to provide to us uh, here or to you guys here in the course and to me because they're helping you. Take it away. Hi, hi everyone. Sorry, it was taking a second for it to my mic to click on. Um, but hi, my name is Ashlyn O'Neill. Thank you, uh, Dr. Trant, for the introduction. Um, I don't know if Dina is here yet, but she is a PALS leader who will be joining me um, as well, just to kind of give a brief introduction to what it is, who we are, why you're getting announcements on Blackboard um, that you probably have no idea where it's coming from. Uh, so some of you who may have taken general chemistry in the last few years may have been may, may be familiar with what PALS is, but what we stand for is peer assisted learning sessions. And basically what I do is um, I hire upper year students who have previously succeeded in your course specifically have demonstrated, um, you know, positive, efficient, effective learning strategies for this type of content. And then they run facilitated learning sessions with you where you are able to connect with your peers, connect um, to your leader, um, ask questions, work through problems um, together and, and help each other out as well. Um, one of the things about PALS is that it is not remedial, which means that it's not just for those who are struggling, it's for everybody. So if you are you know, struggling just to pass or if you're already getting 90s and just wanna up your game a little bit, it's beneficial to anyone. What we have found in the past is that students um, tend to increase their grades by between three and 5% overall, um, which can be pretty big for someone who's going from a 78 to uh, an 83, for example. Um, <clears throat> in your in your grades and then in addition to getting better grades and what we really uh pride ourselves on is um the ability to kind of help you become your own independent learner so really learning what works for you learning what strategies are best um, for different types of problems and our leaders because they're they're you know um uh, well versed in this area can kind of tell you some of their tips and tricks that they've found useful before. So maybe some shortcuts to problem solving um, issues or ways to identify, you know, certain types of things that are going on and, and ways to um, to go about solving those problems or working through um, an issue in your class. So thank you to Madison and Olivia who have, um, I think they've both participated in PALS before and um, actually you can Partially thank Madison because she asked about getting PALS into organic chemistry. Um, so we've gotten a lot of a lot of responses like that over the last few years. Like, can you please start offering this in other classes? So here we are in organic chemistry for the first time. And uh, we're hoping that you will take this opportunity. It's free, it's optional, um, it's anonymous to your instructor, and it's really a place that you can come and, you know, you can make the, the mistakes in these sessions, um, you know, that you might not want to make on, on, your, on your assessments. Um, and if Dina is here, I will have her introduce herself as well. She was just in the wrong channel a few seconds ago. Oh, okay. Okay. So I think she might be trying to jump into this one. <clears throat> oh, I see. Okay. Confusing. Um, yes, lovely teams. There's always issues with technology and um, these things happen all the time. Um, but Dina, I'm just going to tag her in a message to see if, uh, oh, she's here. Yes, I made it. Uh, so I was just, I kind of gave them a rundown of um, the program and I just thought you'd like to introduce yourself. OK, um, so hi, guys, my name is Dina. I am one of the two leaders for Chem 2300 this semester. Um, another leader is called Harveen, but she couldn't make it today, unfortunately. I am in my fourth year of honors chemistry and um, I'm really glad to take on this semester and uh, do some problem solving with you guys. I will also note too that for the first time, one of our leaders actually works directly with your instructor in um, his research lab. So um, 
she and uh, Dr. Trant can also, and Harveen, can also kind of discuss, um, you know, as the semester goes on, like what things that, you know, you you all seem to be struggling with the most so that we can help you as much as we can in our sessions. And when I say we, I mean Dina and Harveen because I don't run them. I'm not a chemist. Um, I just help, I coordinate the program and I'm a learning specialist. Um, uh, so Dina and Harveen are, you know, eager, ready, willing to help you. Um, and so if you um, go on to, um, as you can see, Blackboard, and you go into organizations and find PALS for Organic Chemistry, um, there you can join the virtual PALS. And that, that's where we'll also post announcements and communications for you to keep up with knowing when the schedule is, et cetera. So if you go there, we have a survey up right now um, for you to um, indicate what your availability is and what your likelihood is of attending sessions and then we can get sessions planned and start offering them next week for you all um, in preparation for your first um, uh, midterm. So um, I'll give I know I've, I've already taken up five minutes of Dr. Trant's time but um, if anyone has uh, any questions I'd um, I'd be happy to answer any now or you can always reach out to pals at uwindsor.ca. All right, well, that's us. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Trant, for allowing us to come in and uh, take up some of your time. I hope to see, or I hope that um, some of you, where are the sessions? They are on Blackboard um, through the organizations uh, called PALS for Organic Chemistry. Um, and then when you log on, there will be a virtual PALS button along the menu on the side. Click on that and join the room um, and you'll be able to find your way. And we'll post another announcement with all, the, all of the instructions for you to get in. Um, so don't worry too much if you can't get in right now. Uh, we'll post those instructions before the first um, session. All right. All right. Thank you so much. Enjoy and uh, good luck this term. Okay, perfect. Um, and I, I can't emphasize this enough, like use all the resources that are available to you. If you don't get something, so we're starting a new um, a new system as well to assist. So Samra, who I think is just not currently in this meeting, is also be, going to be holding um, GA office hours, the hour after our uh, Wednesday and Monday lectures. Uh, probably on this channel. So basically as I leave, she'll be here and she'll be able to answer any additional questions. You'll have a different way of asking those questions. Um, I'll be sending out office hours next week, formalizing them and making them available. Uh, again, I'll probably do them on this channel. I'll just hang on this channel. People join, answer questions. Uh, I will send out a formal announcement for when the midterm is. It is October 23, noon. Um, and I, once I put it into writing, I am never saying when it is again. Please read the, so I've gotten an awful lot of emails and I'm looking at the attendance today. Um, there's like 110 of you guys here, so about a third of the class. Hopefully the rest watch it online or they don't need it. Um, you guys are probably the wrong people to be talking to. The, there, there's a lot of information in the syllabus. So the answer to almost most of the emails I've sent is please check the syllabus. So if you have a question, please check the syllabus because otherwise you'll just get like a uh, a bitchy response from me saying please check the syllabus. Um, the one good question is when's the midterm? I will be posting that. I'll be adding it to the syllabus and then my answer to that will be please check the syllabus. Uh, I do want to thank the people who pointed out that the schedule was not lined up with the syllabus. Um, I don't know how the hell that happened. Uh, I'm really sorry. And then I thought I had corrected it and I had saved it and I had uploaded the wrong file. Uh, which was the original file, so it still wasn't changed. And I thought, why is anyone complaining about this? I've changed it because uh, I'm a moron. So I deeply apologize for that schedule. I like double downloaded it and like tried on different computers. So the one online is now the one there. It lines up directly subject for subject with the videos in the syllabus. So if you don't know which video you should be watching, you should look in the schedule what we're going to be covering in class today and then watch the videos that are entitled that on the syllabus. One thing I just want to point out, I, I don't know why I'm saying this. I'll have to put it in writing. There's only a third of you here. Um, is that it's not one to one time wise. We have done more than where we are in the course, like more than number of hours of lecture we've had, 
in video, and that's because a lot of that is background information. I want to focus on important stuff in these classes. I don't want to cover a content that for 80% of you, you've seen it before. OK, I am now going to share my screen and we are going to get going. Um, share screen, share screen. Does this work? Maybe slideshow. Uh, no, I give bad enough presentations as is. I don't need PowerPoint to help me with better ones. OK. What I want to cover today is something we've been kind of banging around a little bit. It's getting a little bit ahead of ourselves. If there, so first of all, if there are any questions about. The lectures to do with. Uh, stability functional groups or intermolecular forces and isomerization. That are not directly questions about the assignment. I am not answering any questions about the assignment. There was an error on the assignment. If you did a question, it was confusing on the assignment. Try and reopen the assignment. Yeah. OK, I have a question. Resins can carbon hold lone pairs? Absolutely. Absolutely carbon can hold lone pairs. But only if it's got an orbital to do it. So the, the, what do I, what the hell did he just mean by that? OK, let's say we have. This molecule. That's formaldehyde. I don't know why I drew in all the H's. Two resonance structures you can draw from here. You can draw the smart one, which puts the electrons onto oxygen. Let's draw in all the lone pairs. So if we draw the smart one and put the electrons onto oxygen, and we calculate the formal charge, the oxygen is positive, the carbon, carbon is positive, the oxygen is negative. I do know the difference between plus and minus. If we draw the dumb one, and just because it's dumb doesn't mean it's impossible, it just makes it dumb. This might not have been the best example because this is a dumb example. I could have put the electrons onto carbon, and this actually leads directly into what I want to talk today, so thank you very much for this question. And there's a lone pair on carbon. <coughs> I also drew one too many hydrogens because I drew something with five bonds, which was impossible. Because again, I'm not very bright sometimes. There, that's better. I'm sorry, anyone who was pointing out that that was wrong. Uh, we have not gone over how to rank resonance structures from most stable to least. We are going to do some of that today because we we're going to talk about stability because stability just takes up so much time. So if nobody has anything else to talk about, I want to get a little bit ahead and talk about some stability stuff, which is kind of what the next block of the course is about. And it turns out what the entire course is about. Um, so yes, yeah, we we are going to go over E and Z stuff quite a bit later, Amanda. Um, you're we're going to talk about some stability stuff and go over E and Z. Ah. Uh, Madison asked a question. This may be a dumb question, but if we're given a line structure with some elements attached to the carbon chain and no electron pairs are given, how do we know which line, which atoms have lone pairs? So um, what you do is if there's no charges written, you assume that everything has the lone pairs. Oxygen, oxygen generally will have two lone pairs. Nitrogen generally will have one, one lone pair. The halogens, chlorine, fluorine, iodine, bromine, Acetine, no one ever does anything with acetine. It's like the, the loser element. Uh, they have three lone pairs. So you would expect to see the num that number of lone pairs on there. You would in intuitively put it on there. Now, if the structure still doesn't make sense, for example, let's say I drew a structure like this. Okay, so the convention is and I think Dr. Hayward went over this in his lecture. If you draw if you draw a carbon like this, you don't need to draw in the hydrogens. But if you draw a heteroatom, anything not carbon or hydrogen, you must draw in the hydrogens. So what I've drawn here doesn't make a lot of sense. If we turn this into a Lewis dot structure.
we get this. With a sort of a big question mark over the nitrogen, what the hell is going on with the nitrogen? Well, there's no other atoms there. We know nitrogen has five electrons. And we know that one of them is here. The other one, of course, come in this bond comes from carbon. So there's four other electrons. So it should be like that to get five valence electrons. And then, so this is one of these tricky ones. This is a stupid one because this is not a, this is not a normal molecule. Um, and so what we would have to do here is we're like, okay, well now we can calculate the formal charge on this. Five. Well, I guess this is actually a formal charge of zero, isn't it? Because that's a nitrine. So if nothing else is written like that, that's just it's neutral. Because five minus one half of two minus four equals zero. But it's weird because nitrogen doesn't have its full octet. If you give nitrogen its full octet, which you really want to do, and I think in some of the assignment questions, I say assume every atom has its full octet. And so in that case, you would draw the full octet. You would do five minus one half of two minus six. And then suddenly the nitrogen is minus two. Can I please give a summary of what lectures we should be watching? OK. Um, I'm going to do this, and if anyone ever asks me a question on email, I'm going to say, go look at this part of the lecture. So I'm going to do this once, and that makes sense. OK, so I'm going to share from this Teams window. Teams. Screen. OK, here is the schedule. It is under syllabus. It has the dates. It has boxes saying these are the subjects we will be covering on those dates. That is, I don't know what that is, but it is not. Um, not related to this course. Open the syllabus. Here is the posted syllabus. It has titles for subjects with links to videos. Notice 1G is solubility, stability and functional groups and more one. And today we are doing stability and functional groups and up here we did intermolecular forces and isomerization. So these subjects fall. It says over, overview the basics chapter one and two. As you notice, the syllabus is divided up into that way. Now there is an absolutely perfect, uh, where the hell did I put my syllabus? <laughs> oh, there it is. There is an absolutely perfect overlap between the course material, the, the, the textbook material and the chapters and exactly what we're covering in the course but it's pretty damn close. We are going to be covering everything. I'm trying not to discuss too much stuff in these live lectures that we didn't cover there, but you might cover a few things in those lectures that we don't cover in the course yet. We are going to get to all of it. I've tried to lay it out as much as possible. Um, and then we're going to be shifting over to part two. So acid bases, molecules are lazy, acid and base reactions is an example, analyzing uh, resonance and then analyzing equilibria. So A through D, and if you look at the confirmation, that is exactly the titles that are used in these videos. And if you look at the schedule, that is exactly basically the titles used in these uh, in the subjects we are covering. So for Friday's class, um, which is well today, I guess we're kind of in here and I want to start covering some of this stuff. Um, you would be watching the videos associated with these. Now, some of these subjects are covered in the same lecture. So in some cases, when you click on this, you're going, I've already seen that lecture. Great. You've already seen that lecture. But if you're looking for specifically that subject, I'm not leaving it out of here, so I'm duplicating things when one lecture covers multiple things. Um, Samra went back over this and tried really hard to actually put timestamps in places on the lectures to link them so that you kind of start at the right point in the lecture. Um, She's good at that, but it, it's not absolutely perfect. However, overall, there are 36 hours of posted YouTube videos. We have 36 hours of in-class time. They more or less correspond directly. 
But as I said, it's not one to one. It's not one hour of video, one hour of class time. Right now we've covered a lot more video and now we're going to slow down the number of videos you're going to be watching over the more or less the rest of the course. You're going to spend less time out of class watching videos because you're kind of ahead up front, which is good. Um, because then we get to spend a bit more time solving particular problems, which is what the hard thing is. And I had to rush through it when I've taught this live. And now we're going to be able to go more slowly and address questions. And that's really, really promising. Uh, Mohammed, you have, a you have your hand up, a couple of hands up. Uh, I have Alyssa and Mohammed, uh, Mohammed with their hands up. So any questions? Hi. Hey. I, I'm sorry. I just sorry. I just had a quick question. Um, yeah. So if you have like pro uh, propene, so like three carbons. Oh, um, so you're going like straight. You're ignoring everything I just said. And you're going straight to the course material. Um, I'm going to yeah, come I right back to your question, question, Alyssa. Let's just see if Mohammed if Mohammed had a question about the logistics stuff I was just talking about, and then I'll come right okay, back. Okay, no to problem. You. I promise. No, my question is similar to hers. I just okay. don't understand. And, uh, like, and Alyssa gets to go first because I called on her first. All right. Okay, all right. Alyssa, over to you, boss. Um, okay, so if you have three carbons and then you have one double bond on the first carbon and then one double bond, or like just as an example, like as a resonance structure. So if you move that double bond to the next carbon, like what's the difference? Like, does it make any difference on the structure? Because like I'm drawing these resonance structures and then it's moving all these double bonds. I'm like, what's the difference from just keeping it in the same spot? If you know Perfect. what I mean, sorry. I do know what you mean and it's, and it's a brilliant question. So I'm okay. going to answer it in two parts. The first part is, let, let's be clear about this just so that you and I and our you know 120 closest friends um, make sure we understand what we're talking about. Are you trying to move a double bond in the top? Would you try and move the double bond in the top structure or just the bottom structure? Or would you try it in both? Or just the top structure and not the bottom structure? Just like to make a resonance structure, you, right. you, you try and move the, the one double bond, right? Right. So are these are the two things I've drawn there? This can you? Yeah, you can see my screen. Are the two things I've drawn there the same thing? Well, the the second one has the charge, so no. Right. OK, and what? Uh, what's the other difference? What does the top one have that the bottom one doesn't? It has more hydrogens. Perfect. Awesome. <laughs> no, you're that 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 that's literally the answer. So yeah. Okay. Can the top? So I'm going to draw something, and you're going to tell me if I'm allowed to do. I'm not not saying if it's if it's worthwhile, but am I allowed to do this? Okay. You can, it's making five bonds. Sweet. Genius. Okay, yeah. Uh, Alyssa is absolutely right. What I've just drawn there is not allowed. Verboten. Germans say it better. So yeah, you can't do that. Five bonds, five orbitals actually is the problem. Um, so if you can move the charge, just kind of, you can yeah. do it. Right, with the bottom one we can, right? Because it's, it's only making, it's only using three orbitals. Because that positive charge is sitting in an empty p orbital. If you drew out okay. the LCAO, um, you would draw, okay, yeah, sp2, sp2, and then there's this empty p orbital. And it needs to be p because if it wasn't p, you couldn't do the resonance because it needs to be p to do a double bond, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now, I didn't draw in the hydrogens over here, but there's actually two of them here. These guys are the same thing. These are functionally identical. Mm -hmm. Okay. So is either one better than the other? Nope. That's what those I'm asking. Identical. <laughs> they are at, those two are absolutely identical, but it's good that it can do it because now if I try and draw the overall resonance hybrid of this, I can honestly say this is one half plus and one half plus. Okay. Okay. Now, if there was no resonance possible, one of those carbon atoms would be carrying an entire positive charge on its own with no chance to share that heavy load. Atoms hate carrying a single charge. If you can share the charge, if you can smear that charge over multiple atoms, you always will because it's 
it's like x it's not like one is half plus half it's it's the same thing there's plus one on the overall molecule what's the problem um but if if there's plus one on a single atom and it can't move all that positive charge is localized in one place and it's kind of repelling itself whereas if you have it spread out over multiple places then you know you're not paying as much energy the positive charge is diluted diffuse and weakened and softened and it's much more stable so Whenever you can spread charge out, the more you can spread charge out, the more stable the charge. Okay. So, got another question for you, Alyssa, before we before I let you go, because um, I, I just have a question. I have a question of what you think. Uh, and you're welcome to say I have done my part and I'm I'm done. That's okay too. No, but if you, know, <laughs> if you know the answer to this, that's good. So I've drawn two new molecules here. Well, okay. one the same and one new one. Which one of those positive charges is more stable? Top one or the bottom one? And consider resonance. I've just drawn one resonance structure, but consider all the resonance structures. I want to say the second one. OK, I like what you want to say. OK. Why are you thinking that? Because you can move it around more, like you can move the charge around more. Absolutely. It is that yeah. it's that cool. simple. That positive charge, right? You can draw two resonance structures. You can go left or you can go right, right? Mm -hmm. So if if you kind of do the, you know, the 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 number cr number crunching, and this time they're not all identical. Um, I'm gonna say that we're about one quarter. I'm making up numbers here. It's not quite as extreme as this, and we're gonna talk about why in a second. Um, we'll try. But we've kind of one quarter of a plus, one half of a plus, one quarter of a plus. No one overall it still adds up to plus one, but everyone's carrying less charge in general. Here we had two plus one halves. Here we have less than that in most oh, cases. Okay. That makes so we've sense. spread out the charge more, so we've stabilized it. Everyone's carrying less to total charge. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, we're going to come back to why that middle one there is carrying more charge. But I'm before I do that. Yeah, stable sharing the burden. It is easier. Uh, OK, so I have this giant centrifuge that I've been trying to move for about three months and I'm not allowed to move it and my guys aren't allowed to move it because we'd be breaking union rules because uh, it's somebody's job to move the centrifuge. But whenever we try and get anyone to move the centrifuge, it's a, it's basically a steel box that weighs 400 pounds. Um, they try they come over here and there's like two of them and they try and pick it up and they can't move it because it's too heavy. So um, it, uh, of course, no office on campus could move this centrifuge. So we had to call in an external moving company to move the centrifuge. Now, one option is the external moving company could have brought in a specialty piece of equipment to move the centrifuge. No, they just brought in four guys to move the centrifuge. So four people moved it and that was fine. And it was because four people were splitting the burden of this 400 pound piece of steel. Uh, instead of two people splitting the burden of this 400 pound piece of steel, it's easier if you share the burden. Charges are the same way, share the burden. More atoms that can participate, the better. Um, do we apply acid strength rules when ranking stability of resonance structures? Absolutely. Yes. Uh, hope, so it's considered to be two resonance structures even though they're identical, uh, the ones up here, yes. Yeah, they are, they are, it does have two resonance structures. They're degenerate, they're the same thing but they're different because theoretically, if you could stick a hat on one of those carbons and not a hat on the other carbon, they would be different carbons. You're still spraying that, even though they're identical in energy, you're spraying that charge out over more places. Uh, we didn't do any questions for isomerization last class. I'm happy to talk about if somebody's got some questions about isomerization. Uh, what do we need to know in terms of isomerization? What we were really more talking about was the nature of isomers and what an isomer is. Uh, we're going to really dig into that a little bit more when we start talking about um, diastereomers and enantiomers in the stereochemistry section. So I wouldn't get too, too caught up, but right now you need to know what an isomer is. An isomer are two molecules that have the same molecular formula, but are not the same molecule. That is an isomer. Then there's all sorts of different subtypes of isomers. We'll get into that, but the overall type of isomer same molecular formula, not the same molecule. That's an isomer. 
I answered that one. Uh, somebody else jumped in. Why are orbitals coming in and out of the page? How to know when orbitals coming in and out of the page? Uh, sorry, can you explain how the charge on the carbons is positive even though they want more electrons? Can I ask my question on mic? Yeah, Mohammed, go ahead. Uh, so I'm still a little bit confused on um, resonance. Like, how like how do I know if something is not a valid resonance structure? Like compared to the original one, you know what I mean? Yeah. So something is not a valid resonance structure. Uh, there's two things. Two things make something a valid resonance structure. Now I've got your attention because I listed something. Um, and then you're going to be really disappointed with what I say. But we'll try and do some examples and then you'll be less disappointed with what I say. And then you're going to try and practice it and you might be more disappointed. Um, it's really a freaking roller coaster. A must be a valid Lewis structure. No more than four orbitals. OK, so if you draw something, it's got five orbitals on one atom. It's not a valid resonance structure because it's not a valid Lewis structure. You must have a valid Lewis structure. B. Um, must have you really sort of must have followed the rules to get there. And this really leads us into what I want to start talking about. We talked briefly. I know Dr. Hayward talked briefly about arrows. I've discussed briefly about arrows and I've tried to find what that is, but let's let's really talk about this a little bit more. What do I mean? So here, there are basically within a molecule, there are three valid moves. It's kind of like chess. Like there's rules. One. Lone pair. Makes adjacent double bond. I'm actually going to say multiple bond because it could be a triple bond. If adjacent atom can use another orbital or has an available orbital. Okay, so in this case we have there drawn to the left. This, I'm going to draw another hydrogen. This uh, carbon adjacent to this nitrogen is a positively charged carbon is only making three bonds two to hydrogen one to nitrogen it's got an empty orbital that orbital is going to be an empty p orbital because it is adjacent to a full p orbital because we have the possibility of making an o bond they are only p orbitals because the o bond is makeable if for example we have like a magic barrier thingy that prevented the lone pair on nitrogen interacting with that positive carbon, they would not be in p orbitals because p orbitals are higher energy than sp3 orbitals. They would both be sp3 because it's better energy. If there was like a magic barrier that prevented a bond being made. Fortunately, there is no such thing as a magic barrier that prevents bonds being made. If you've got a lone pair next to an orbital that's empty, they will turn themselves into p orbitals to make a double bond because that's better. So, this is an example of that first arrow. I am using a lone pair electron to make an O bond. That is one of my moves. My second move brings all the electrons to my yard. And so what we can do is we can take a multiple bond and move a bond 
I'm what I'm talking about here is all going to be ionic resonance. I'm interested in moving two electrons at a time. Very end of the course, we're going to come back to this. We're going to see radical resonance, and I'm sorry for that, uh, where we're going to move one electron at a time. But here we're only going to worry about two electrons at a time. We'll get we'll get real masters at two electrons. Then we'll worry about one electron because it behaves weird and it's silly, and um, we will have to discuss it. But multiple bonds, multiple bonds, and move one, multiple bond, and move a bond to adjacent atom. What do I mean by that? Any double or triple bond. I don't know. This is CH2 as well. So these are both CH2s. I can move the electrons onto an adjacent atom. It's it's actually the absolute inverse of what I just did. The third move is kind of a combination of the two. And actually, you know, technically that's all the moves you need. You can string these together. There's a lot of shutting up outside my window. They're doing something to the roof. It sounds like somebody's dying. I hope they're not dying. I'm on the third floor. I can't help. I think they're just trying to talk over a motor. So we can have a situation where it's kind of a combination of these things. I'm drawing two arrows at a time, but really it's just the two things I did earlier. The left hand arrow is moving two electrons from a bond onto a carbon. The right hand arrow is moving a lone pair into the bond next to the atom. And we can, you know, you can draw lots of arrows one after the other, but they're all combinations of these two first rules. It's just you're allowed to string them together. Those are the rules. So you're not allowed skipping atoms. For example, one thing you are not allowed to do even though it is really tempting. You might have a molecule like this. And you're thinking, OK, there's a lone pair. There's a positive charge. I really want to make it all bond. Um, something like this. And I'll draw a resonance structure. And I will do that. And I guess there should be a positive charge here. So you're breaking a rule. You're moving the electrons not to the adjacent atom, you're moving them two atoms over. And what I've drawn there actually makes no sense. I, I've drawn something completely that that the arrow just is completely nonsensical. And it's because the moves are really simple. Lone pair to adjacent to adjacent sigma bond to make a double bond or double bond to adjacent atom to make a new lone pair. So if you follow that and everything's a valid Lewis structure, then they are all valid resonance structures. What about I something don't like know if that helped. <laughs> what about something like uh, OK, let's say we had like a carbon like ring, like eight carbons and we have two double bonds in the middle. This sounds and like an assignment. If, question. if it's if it starts, OK, well, if it starts off question. like uh, if it starts off uh, neutral, is it wrong if if it moves and it stays neutral or? Uh, if things can stay neutral, but remember you need to do resonance, you need to have p orbitals. OK, and I, I can't say anything. I Yeah, we're, we're getting too close to an assignment question. OK, thank you. Because I wrote a question like that yesterday. Um, ah, so Gary has layered the 
rule, uh, uh, he's getting fancy, saying, so wouldn't that mean that large molecules usually have more stable charge spread? What if one molecule has a total charge of plus one and a small and a large molecule has a total charge of plus two? Would the charge spread on the resin structure dictate the more stable molecule? Uh, and Amanda liked his question. So I guess I have to address it. What I am going to say is that the overall size of the molecule is irrelevant. It's the size of how that charge is spread locally. So you can have a molecule that's a thousand atoms and it's got a plus one charge, but that plus one charge is stuck on one atom and can't get off it. So it doesn't matter that it's got a thousand atoms. It's got a plus one charge on one atom. Whereas you get another molecule that's got like 10 atoms and it's got a plus one charge spread over three atoms. It's a lot smaller. It spread the charge over stuff a lot better. It's all about how focused is the charge. The rest of the molecule can screw off. It doesn't matter what it's doing. We're going to look at what the charge is doing. And I don't know. I, like I like magic. Um, like you know, not not real. Well, actually, I'd love real magic. I read a lot of that stuff. But you know, I like sort of stage magicians. And if you're trying to figure out what a stage magician does, as a stage magician, you're constantly trying to distract the audience with stuff that doesn't matter, you know, flashy shit, so that the stuff that does matter, they don't notice because they're paying attention to your flashy shit. Um, charges are the stuff that matters. I can have like a humongous stage show behind me, like a humongous molecule, lots and lots of complexity. Don't let that distract you. Reactions happen where the charges are. The rest of the stuff is just there for decoration. Um, focus. Don't don't let complexity trick you. Uh, just nail stuff down because chemistry is a really reductive science. It really comes down to what are the electrons going to do? And the electrons are more or less localized over a few number of bonds at worst over resonance. So the rest of them all can go hang itself. So that's why you can do chemistry on like complex proteins with you know hundreds of thousands or millions of atoms. And I can say, yeah, it's going to do this exact reaction on this residue. Because the rest of it is just distraction. Does stringing them together mean moving two pairs of electrons at once? Yep, that does. So you're kind of bumping the electrons along. If you move it to the next bond, that is okay, right? Uh, nor I, uh, on the, I. You're talking about this example here. Like if I had drawn the electrons going to here. What's the problem with that? That isn't allowed. Can somebody tell me? Yeah, Claire, I can go pop back to that. Shit. No, I went too far. So must be a valid Lewis structure. Must have followed the electron pushing rules. There are two electron pushing rules. It's kind of a third one, but two. Electrons go to next bond, bond goes to atom. Why is this not allowed? Carbon can't make that many bonds. Fatima, you win the award. Right. Because we didn't draw in that there are two hydrogens already on here. And so now when I count up the number of atoms on elect bonds that that carbon is making, it's making five. That is not a valid Lewis structure. Not allowed. And so there's no way for me to get those electrons over to that positive charge. I can't help. Nitrogen wants to help. It can't help. It can't get the electrons there. Can I walk you through question 1G on assignment X? Yes, I can. And I opened assignment X for this because I realized we will be doing that. Um, OK, perfect. Oh, I like this one. OK, so we're actually going to start talking about stability with this example. So there's a lecture on stability is lecture seven. Uh, lecture seven is probably the most important lecture in the entire course. I might say that again later, but about another lecture, but it's one of the two most important lectures in the entire course. Uh, Malika, you use both. And we are definitely going to do structural effects on a city. That's really what I want to actually spend the entire class doing, but we're not. So I guess we're going to spend the entire next class doing it because we spent the class talking about logistics about things.
but we'll, we'll talk about this one um, because it kind of comes into it. So I'll do this and then I'll talk about acidity and I'll keep going on. Uh, you know what? Actually, I'm going to I'm going to address Amanda's question first. Then I'm going to come back to Leon's question because Leon's is specific. Amanda's a bit more general. OK. If you've watched part of lecture seven because it was kind of attached to one of the lectures that you uh, part of the end of lecture six. I want to talk about acids and bases. We'll come back. So I'm just going to skip to the next slide if I can and not just draw random things. So let's say we had. To an acid base reaction. So a typical question I like asking. And I've actually asked this on exams before. And then I cried when not everyone got it right. I actually cry sometimes sitting over the marks and I start wondering what choices I've made in my life that I do this. Um, and and I, I it, it never bothers me too much when I see students really trying on things and, and getting it wrong, but it makes me just so pained when I see people clearly didn't try very hard and I just why don't you like this? Anyways, typical question. I might say here is an acid base equilibrium. Let's pull that apart for a second because there are three words there. Acid base equilibrium. An acid. Is anything. That requires like is going to. We've got a bunch of different definitions of acids and bases. I think the best definition is an acid is something that receives electrons. A base is something that donates electrons. Generally, when we talk about acids and bases, we are talking about protons, H plus being the thing that's being received and being given. And so this acid is receiving electrons. There are electrons going from the oxygen hydrogen bond onto the oxygen. And the reason they are doing that is because this is, I think, maybe our first intermolecular, inter versus intra, inter between, intra within. This is our first intermolecular arrow. I am using a lone pair on the oxygen to go snap up that big juicy hydrogen on the other oxygen. And when it does, that hydrogen can only make one bond. So if hydrogen is making a bond with a new oxygen, it must break the bond with the old oxygen because hydrogen can only make one bond. And that gives us the result on the right hand side of the arrow. This is an equilibrium arrow. It means this shit goes back and forwards. Almost all reactions we are going to see in this course are in equilibrium of some form or another. They can go back and forwards. Because almost all chemistry goes back and forwards because it would be simpler if it didn't and it doesn't want to be simple. OK. Yeah, so notice there is an extra pair of elect. Oh shit. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Thank you, Noor. Uh, good catch. So. Yeah, X uh, because I'm an idiot somewhere in Noor. The, the rule of thumb is that as you get closer to the board, you get stupider and I'm really close to this board because I'm like you know, six inches away from my tablet because I'm short sighted. So what we have here is we have the hydroxide, the OH minus grabbing a proton using a pair of electrons. The arrow goes from the electrons to the hydrogen. And then we're breaking this bond and a bond that I'm showing that by taking the arrow from. The bond to the oxygen. OK, cool. That's arrow pushing. We're going to do lots more arrow pushing. You're going to do lots of arrow pushing practice pushing arrows. Don't push them backwards. And notice I drew this one first. I always started at where the most electrons are. Uh, it's not strictly necessary to get the same answer going the other way. It's just do yourself a favor when you're very early in this before you've established habits. Always start your arrow drawing at the place with the most electrons. What's the question in this example? Yeah, so the question is which way is the equilibrium lie? 
Does the equilibrium lie towards the right or the left? OK, so what I'm what I'm really asking there. Is which side is more stable? Which side is lower energy? Molecules are lazy. Molecules will always go towards the more stable side. OK, great. That doesn't help me that much. So what I'm really asking is which of these charges is more stable? There's the same number of atoms on both sides, so it doesn't help me on stability overall. So the only real difference is which of the charges is more stable. That's what this question results to. That's what every single acid base equilibrium falls down to is which of the charges is more stable. It is based on pKa, but pKa is actually based on which of the charges is more stable. pKa is just a number. It's a it's a representation of reality. Reality is which of these charges is more stable. Amanda, you've been watching my nut lectures. Or you had a very, very bright teacher. We've got Divjot saying right because the negative charge in the oxygen can be moved around. Fuck yeah, you're absolutely right. That is exactly the right answer. So on the left, negative stuck on oxygen. On the right, Negative can move. Right, there's a resonance structure. It's on oxygen. They're both on oxygen. That's all the same. What's different is that we have a resonance structure where we can move the electrons. OK. Let's do another example. So let's say we had a case. Somebody's got their. Samurai, I think you have your microphone on. I'm just going to mute you. There you go. So this is Samurai, everybody. Um, she she just had the microphone on and somebody obviously walked into the room. She had closed the door and it was squeaking. Which is not that bad when you consider what you've overheard on Zoom calls. So um, she's going to be running the. Uh, more resonance means more stable. Thank you, Mil Malika and Emily. Absolutely. OK, uh, so my question here is which way does the equilibrium lie and why? Uh, as a first exercise, just for practice, draw the arrow, draw in the lone pairs and draw the arrow for the reaction for going from left to right. You could equally draw it from right to left, but let's do it from left to right. Um, so while you're doing that, Samra will be holding, uh, you know, office hours with Samra, organic chemistry with Samra. We need to come up with a catchy title uh, in the hour immediately following the lecture on Mondays and Wednesdays. Um, and she'll just take over once I jump out. Uh, we're trying to have two different time slots so that if you have a lab, you can catch one of them. OK. Bray Braden said to the left because the fluorines are closer to the negative charge. Why does that matter? You're right. There's no resonance structures in either one of these. Every atom here is sp3. Induction. OK, so Braden has been following up and he knows his induction. So what the hell is induction? Uh, watch the lectures. Lecture seven, most important lecture. Watch lecture seven. If you get lecture seven, you get this course. It actually, it's almost that simple. Like if anything's that simple, it's almost that simple. 
each of these fluorines, going back to that electrolyte negativity lecture that Dr. Hayward covered right up front, dipole moments and things, and what we covered there is pulling electron density out of the carbon. What does that do to the carbon? It makes it delta plus. What does that do? It can pull electron density from the oxygen. What does that do? It makes the oxygen less negative. What does that do? You got more guys carrying that centrifuge, right? Otherwise, the oxygen is carrying this goddamn 400 kilogram thingy. I think I just went from pounds to kilograms, whatever. It's heavy. doesn't matter at that point. Um, ginormous piece of freaking steel. Uh, oxygen is trying to carry it on its own. It's not doing great. Now carbon can help because it's right there. Whereas with this, you have the same effect. The fluorine is pulling away from the carbon, but then that effect grows weaker over distance. Now, induction can theoretically go both ways. There's no reason why you can't be donating electrons. Um, it's just, we're organic chemists, so we generally don't, because everything we're interested in is more electronegative than carbon. So in general, everything pulls electrons away from carbon, except for carbon, which doesn't pull electrons away from carbon because they're both carbon, if there's nothing else there, or hydrogen. But everything else pulls electrons away from carbon. So induction almost always almost always stabilizes negative charges. Destabilizes. OK, uh, we're at 227. Answer is left because Braden is right. Because this fluorine is closer, so the effect is bigger. So that positive, that carbon right next to that oxygen is much more positive. Whereas, you know, this carbon is just as positive as that carbon. This one's less positive because it's further away. This one's less positive. And so at this point here, you've got this little pathetically positive carbon next to the oxygen, and it's not really a lot of help lifting that centrifuge. I should actually bring a picture of the centrifuge later. It doesn't actually look as heavy as it actually is. Um, so the closer the fluorines are, the bigger the effect. The closer the center of induction, the bigger the effect. The pole is listened by, lessened by distance. Oh, yeah, OK, on the left hand case, it is not lessened by distance, but the pole is always lessened by distance. Yeah, the centrifuge example is real. It took us three. We had this freaking centrifuge sitting in a freaking corridor for two months because nobody on this bloody campus can move a freaking 300 pound instrument. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, it, it makes me really angry to think about it. And then the company that sold it to us sent us the wrong cables. We came and plug it into the wall. Doing science is really hard. <laughs> I spent a lot of time doing shit like that. Um, the auction can't, yeah, but the auction can't make bonds in any of these cases. There's no resonance possible in any of these cases. And that's because the charge is on an atom that is adjacent to an atom, and this guy is sp3 because he's got four bonds. And so, you know, this guy's sp3. So it doesn't matter that you want to do resonance, because of course you want to do resonance because you're staying human beings, but you can't because there's no p orbital available because it's sp3. And it's sp3 because it makes four bonds. There's no way for it to be sp2 with a p. It's making four sigma bonds. Okay, I'm going to leave that there for today. Um, watch lecture seven. Uh, the whole acid base stability charge thing. Uh, and we're going to basically spend the next week, I think, continuing to discuss that like because it's really really important so i want to 
I want to go over a metric freak ton of examples. I'm really proud of myself that I watched my language there. Um, over where we're trying to look at charge stability and these kinds of examples. We're going to talk about induction. We're going to talk about uh, orbital so um, atom size. We're going to talk about resonance. We're going to talk about these things all against each other um, and how we can sort of rank resonance structures because all these things are going to go into ranking resonance structures. Uh, Joshua has a question about an ambiguous question on the assignment. Um, sure, if you want to ask. I probably ask it over voice. What if it wasn't F the most any atom would have done it? It doesn't matter if it was F, it could have been oxygen. As long as it was slightly more electronegative than carbon, you would see this effect. Yeah, OK, we don't need to go into the details of the question, Joshua, if you want to ask it. Oh, uh, hello? Yeah, here you are. OK, so there is a question. I was doing the assignment earlier where uh, I'm trying to word this so that it's I don't need to go into the details. But I think there was two uh, choices where I think due to the wording of the question, you could choose either of the two choices, but one contains, say, all of the correct cases, or one doesn't contain all of the cases. Should I go with one that's, I don't know, quote unquote, if more correct? If one is more correct because it has all of them, that is correct. OK. Like if, okay. One, if, if one, like let's say I said, um, which of these atoms have double bonds? And there were five atoms with, OK, there were six atoms with double bonds, and one answer listed six atoms, and one answer listed only four atoms. The one with six would be correct. OK, OK, that's that's it. Yeah. Thank you. And I know that wasn't, that example I gave wasn't specifically a question. Yeah. Uh, no, methanes would be uh, a wash. They'd be identical. So if they were, if those were all, instead of fluorines, those were all carbons, um, there's no real, induction one way or another there Malika so it would basically be the same on both sides you wouldn't it would be a one-to-one -one mixture the equilibrium wouldn't lie one way or the other okay have a really good rest of the day take it easy good luck with the assignment I'd say have fun but that's just way too optimistic Yeah, have a good weekend, everybody, too. I am going to stop recording so it's not so much bedtime at the end of this.